The Legend of Jimmy Spoon by Christiana Gregory. Chapter 11. Winter, 1854. Snow fell in the mountains. Hanabi and her friends sewed Jimmy warm leggings and a shirt. New moccasins came up to his knees. The insides were soft with rabbit fur, and the outer hide had come from the top of an old teepee cover, blackened and waterproof from many cooking fires. Old Mother made him a cape from one of the bajono, from one of the bajono Washaki had killed. It fastened in front with the smooth round tip of an elk antler. A pattern of colored beads adorned the front of his shirt. Fringe dangled from the sleeves and ruffled when he ran. Like a feather in the wind, Old Mother observed. Jimmy had never seen such fine clothes, nor had he ever felt so warm. He liked the hat Old Mother made from muskrat skin. It peaked on top and had two rabbit tails sewn on each side for tassels. The other children weren't dressed quite as splendidly as Jimmy, but after all, he reasoned, he was Dawi to Chief Washaki. He felt important when everybody called him young brother. They were camped near a partly frozen river below High Buttes. Fifty years earlier, the white explorers Meriwether Lewis and William Clark had named it, the, had named it Jefferson River. But to a shocky, it was Piatapa. Hunters brought in twenty elk and three bears who had been sleeping in their dens. The cold had driven the Bajono to their winter range near the streaming near the steaming hot pools by Yellowstone River. Several strays wandered near camps. Their thick fur was crusted with snow and icicles hung below their bellies clinking like the delicate glass chimes Jimmy had heard in Brigham Young's courtyard. Jimmy hurried into the teepee for his bow and arrows. When he crouched beside a log to aim, Washaki's hand fell on his shoulder. We are warm and we have Tao to last until the snows melt. He pointed to the forest where, where two white-tailed deer nibbled at some bark. The Great Spirit will provide fresh meat when we need it. Snow had fallen steadily all night and the drifts were waist-deep. As Jimmy searched for firewood, he was cold. His moccasins were tight below his knees, yet dampness had managed to creep in. His hands were numb, and his runny nose had made ice above his lip. He felt cranky and tired from a head cold. Living with Indians was not always the fun he had thought it would be. He missed his mother's warm kitchen. He even missed working alongside his father in the quiet store. When he returned to the lodge, his arms loaded with kindling, old mother greeted him with a smile. She was kneeling in her customary spot by the fire, a robe of fur over her shoulders. She held out a small square of deer hide. On it were pieces of shredded meat with a sweet aroma. Something new for you to try, she said proudly. Jimmy took it from her and sniffed the meat. He handed it back to her. It is for you to eat, she said. Old Mother nodded for him to take a bite. As she watched him expectantly, he lifted the meat to his lips. The smell bothered him. He frowned. Don't worry, Dawi. It is only Yaya. It is only Yaha cooked with roots. Yaha. Jimmy didn't know Indians ate yellow-bellied marmot, especially during winter when it hibernated. He started to hand it back to her, but the hopeful look in her eyes made him change his mind. He knew she would be insulted if he refused the food. He took a bite, a small bite. He pictured a cat-sized marmot romping through the meadow, then standing on its hind legs to whistle. Jimmy's tongue moved the greasy meat in his mouth side to side, any place to avoid swallowing it. But suddenly, gulp, down it slid. It tasted like rich pork, a taste he didn't like at all. His throat tightened, and with a violent shiver, he vomited into his lap. Ugh! Repulsed by the mess and, the emb and embarrassed, he began to cry. He wiped his mouth with his sleeve, then tried to clean his legs. I've never tasted anything so... How could Jimmy explain? He surprised himself by yelling at old mother fast in English. She couldn't understand his words, but she got, but she understood his face. He punched the tent flap open and launched himself into the snow. He tumbled against the buckskin legs of someone who'd been listening. Jimmy looked up. Washaki, he whispered. It was starting to snow again. White flakes fell against the chief's braids and coated the dark fur of his robe. For several long moments, he stared at Jimmy, then he turned toward his lodge. Jimmy was afraid to move. He was shivering with cold. When Washaki returned, a quiver of arrows was strapped across his chest, and he cradled a bow 
made from white cedar. He walked to the edge of the woods and waited for Jimmy. Is he going to punish me? Jimmy wondered. Panic fluttered in his heart. Why hadn't he stayed with his own family? The worst would be a thrashing with his, with his father's razor strap. And, and right now, Jimmy would settle for ten of those. He felt afraid, even though he'd always known Washaki to be kind. Reluctantly, Jimmy followed Washaki to a grove of aspens. The white branches were bare, with dark ripples in the bark. In the distance, the horses huffed and pawed for, the, for new grass. Poog stood in the corral, watching, knowing he was being observed, deep in Jimmy's humiliation. The chief faced Jimmy, the two eagle feathers in his hair, today signified his marriage to Hanabi, and Jimmy felt sad that he'd never lived to see his own wedding day. It will be lonely dying in the snow, he thought. Dawi, your words have pierced our have pierced our mother. I'll tell her I am sorry. I will do it right now. Jimmy wanted more than anything to run back to their lodge and bury his face in old mother's warm arms. She'll forgive me. I know she will. Washaki hooked an arrow into the string of his bow and handed it to Jimmy. He nodded toward the nearest aspen. Shoot that tree. Jimmy's fingers were stiff around the bow and he was shaking from cold and from terror. He aimed, pulled his arm back, and let go. The arrow drifted to the ground at his feet. Washaki pulled another arrow from his quiver. The shaft was painted with red stripes, and the short feathers at the end were on its end were black. Jimmy aimed again. The arrow thwanged it hit the, as it hit the trunk and stuck. Take the arrow out, commanded Washaki. Jimmy was mystified. He walked slowly to the tree. He pulled hard wiggling it a bit, then it popped free. Now he's going to shoot me, he thought. Washaki stood beside Jimmy and took his hand. He pressed Jimmy's fingers against the hole in the tree. Now remove the hole, said Dawi. Or now remove the hole, Dawi. Jimmy closed his eyes. He understood. And that's the end of chapter 11.